Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage. I'm John Furrier with Rob Streche here, analyzing, as CUBE hosts we always do, getting in the stories no matter what it takes, from the executives to the leaders of the foundation, the open source contributors to engineers. Our next guest is an engineer leading a development team at MinIO, a company we've been covering on theCUBE before. Um, here, Danielle Valdivia. Thanks for joining us to theCUBE. Welcome yeah, to theCUBE. Thank you for having me. You're in the distinguished CUBE alumni list now. Welcome <laughs> to theCUBE. <laughs> thank you. So we, we wanted to get you on to talk about some of the cloud native open source dynamics that are going on. We had saw a container ship moving through the harbor. You know, it was perfect timing on our last mm -hmm. interview. You got a lot of different projects here at the open source. This is not KubeCon. Mm -hmm. This isn't 10,000 people in Europe yeah. or 15,000, 20,000 that might show up in, in Chicago. It's a small crowd here at the Open Source Summit. There's a lot of projects going on, but the right people are here. Yeah. What are you seeing out here in this world? And I know CNCF is a big part of this group. Yeah. How many cloud native conversations are happening here at this event? So the, the main uh, conversation point we're seeing is, okay, uh, we're, we're seeing a big shift in the whole Hadoop ecosystem moving from legacy HDFS start, start implementations, right? That, that was like, the nation open source cradle of data on the open source space, but now that the HDFS ecosystem is sort of collapsing on itself, people are asking, okay, what's next? Where should I be moving my data, right? I'm still, build, I want to build an even larger data lake, but it turns out I cannot move my HDFS into Kubernetes, right, just using upstream HDFS. So that's what Minayo comes into place, right? Pe people are asking, okay, I already have all this investment on my Hadoop pipelines, my Spark pipelines, my Presto, and what do I do now? So the answer is, okay, you move into MinIO, right? So MinIO is just building high-performance object storage. You change the scheme on your pipelines and then you don't have to do anything else, right? Everything just works. And that's where the big conversation topics that we're seeing on here. Yeah, one of the top conversations that Rob pointed out yesterday uh, in our summary was, there's a lot of dependencies between projects now, Yeah. to your point. How has that impacted some of the interop, I won't say interoperability, but the, the cross-project work so, the, so we've been uh, hard at work in convincing people the importance of uh, decoupling compute and storage, right? Coming in from the big data world, people thought, oh, I need to uh, make my compute clusters as big as my storage clusters. So now that they've been, we've been uh, spending years convincing them, okay, you don't need to collocate them, right? You can actually decouple them. And now that uh, companies have been making that investment, when the, when the time comes to actually replace components, right? So of course, they want to make it the least painful as possible. And that's where the S3A connector on the Hadoop ecosystem made it a very clever transition, right? Just change the schema, it just works. Yeah, so help, because uh, I mean, obviously you guys have your open source, and where are you really helping in or playing in the other parts of the ecosystem? Mm -hmm. Are you contributing back to some of the uh, different projects that are going on here, or what, what really is the where you're leveraging in? So from an engineering perspective, From an engineering perspective, yeah. of course. So we're very interested in making it, uh, sure that open source, uh, MinIO works for everyone. Not, not only MinIO, but object storage. Yeah. So object storage has come out as the standard of consuming storage over the internet. And you see that there, there's big companies making an effort, for example, when uh, Amazon wrote the S3 adapter, Right. It made it, it convinced people to start using HDFS. And for example, we saw that some of the ways, for example, Spark consumes storage is making assumptions that it's still using an HDFS. And HDFS has, for example, a rename operation. Object storage doesn't have a rename operation. Right. So we wrote, for example, a Spark committer that actually improves the overall throughput of your Spark pipelines uh, because not everyone is writing like highly optimized Spark pipelines. So we just actually wrote this component and now we're actually considering uh, collaborating back to upstream. That's just one of the efforts, right? Okay. In other projects like PyTorch, TensorFlow, Qflow, we're actually making sure that object storage is always functional. So we're also contributing back in that so area. So you're co contributing that back outside of the MinIO pipelines or product and in back into Spark or which, which group is that going, or project is that going back into? The HDFS projects, yeah, or? I mean, as Spark is managed by uh, Apache. Right. So that, that's going to that team, right? But every now and then, where we make contributions to other smaller open source projects that yeah. we see, because every now and then someone comes with a brand new database, and they say, this yeah. is a brand new database, it works on top of the object storage. And we right. say, that's great, you just need a couple of tweaks to allow for a custom endpoint, and now you can actually test against MinIO. Right, so we like contributing also to all these other projects. Some of them are small personal projects and some are some are sm smaller startups coming into the scene. Yeah. So that's where we like contributing as well. So, so what you're contributing back, just to break it down for the non-technical people, is really how you are able to kind of 
uh, simulate or mask out the metadata aspect on top of uh, an open, uh, I guess you can say an object storage layer. Well, yes, uh, and to some extent, we're, what we're actually contributing is just m giving people the ability that, you know, yes, may maybe Amazon came up with the S3 standard, but you know, there's Minayo, right? So the only thing you need to actually make your product that already works against AWS S3 right. to work with Minayo is just to change the endpoint. So some developers forget that you know, exposing the S3 endpoint, uh, it's important. So we just contribute on that part. It's like, yeah, just do, just do it this way. And now developers mm -hmm. can work locally on their laptops, right? Your DevOps engineers can build CI CD pipelines that test against Minayo, and then production can also run against Minayo, right? So that, that's where we yeah. like contributing as well. Do, do you see a lot of people that are splitting between Minayo and S3 and having different parts of their data lake in different places? Is that yeah. something that's big? That is a big, a big trend that we see our customers doing hybrid deployment, right? And, uh, and when we say hybrid deployment, we see them across clouds. Yeah. So we see customers, for example, that like keeping some of their data on premise, mm -hmm. right, sensitive data and they like having the exact same storage uh, API as they have on AWS. But moreover, we start seeing that sometimes they build storage infrastructure across cloud providers because now it's trendy that you know, a cloud provider region goes down for a reason, right. right? So they like to be protected, so they like deploying across two vendors and having the same storage API makes that, that so much easier. Yeah. What's the biggest thing that you're seeing in open source that, that AI is going to have the most impact for? So the, the in the open source world, uh, I mean, the, the, the impact that I'm seeing in the open source world from the, bringing from the AI, it's all these uh, large language models that spit out code that are, were trained on uh, open source code, right? So even you look at these models and they say, we didn't train on everything, but we train on, on the most popular open source products, right? And that, that taught these models to, to how to code. So the value of all these people collaborating on, and making high quality code is actually coming back to being in the models. So when engineers are actually leveraging LLMs to write code, they're inheriting all this knowledge that open source contributors are building. And do you see that right now in the progress, how legit in terms of coding, mm -hmm. how much human curation do you see going on? Some people are spreading good code. Mm -hmm. I mean, in known use cases. Yeah. You say, build me a website or an e-commerce site, it does that. Yeah. It's not that, I mean, that's in, you know. But Stack Overflow recently had blocked ChatGPT. <laughs> I don't know if you saw that. I read that on Hacker News. Mm -hmm. And uh, very interesting, because they had all those questions. Yeah. They have the prompt engine. The pro yes, exactly. So the, the interesting thing about uh, when, when you look at LLMs, for example, and they're like generalizing knowledge. So the interesting part is, okay, the prompt is quite important, so that you will also see that on GitHub issues, for example. But um, the, the logic that lives throughout the code is also important for the model to memorize. So observing how code is properly built mm -hmm. to address a certain problem, that's, uh, that's mostly what these LLMs need to look, right? So yeah. What do you think this, uh, KubeCon is going to be like in Chicago? Uh, we were just, as you mentioned, we were all together in uh, mm -hmm. KubeCon EU. Um, and it was packed, 10,000, largest it I've was, ever seen KubeCon That was the Europe. biggest that we've was had. A big, that was pretty bad, 2,000 yeah. were on the waiting list. So to me that's a tell sign that the U.S. is going to be a monster show. Mm -hmm. What do you guys think the show's, what do you think the show's going to be? If 10,000 in Europe, what do you think Chicago will be? 15, 20, what's your, what, guess? Oh, Just definitely, guess. at least 20. At least 20, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Rob, what do you think? Yeah, I, th I think it'll be, you know, probably closer to 15, but they'll have a wait list after that, I'm sure that'll, but uh, I'm sure it would be close to 20 wanting to be there, that's for sure. Yeah. All right, so the question we have to ask you as we wrap up this segment, mm -hmm. we'll finish this segment out with the platform engineering conversation. Mm -hmm. What is your view on platform engineering? Because it's become quite the conversation, I and mean, we've been talking about it on theCUBE for a long time, and mm -hmm. everyone knows that. But it's become more of a IT definition, as, a, as DevOps becomes more mainstream, mm -hmm. platform engineering used to be like, Google SRE, oh yeah, hardcore, yeah. spitting glass, eating nails. You know, mm -hmm. hardcore developers, right, the hyperscalers. Yeah. But now as platforms go to IT, mm -hmm. that you got that platform, you, you guys do a lot of storage stuff, okay. Yeah. So, okay, you got platform engineering, you got security, policy, data. Now apps are mm -hmm. in the cloud, yeah. or on premise with cloud operations. They got APIs, they're connected, so they have dependencies. So you got apps have platform-like yeah. features too. How do you view platform engineering versus just a robust app? That, by the way, works together mm -hmm. with other apps. Yeah, well, you see, when 
people are building this transitioning to the, moving their applications into the cloud, and Kubernetes has made a great job in standardizing that, right? Kubernetes has emerged as the operative system of the internet. Mm -hmm. So all these applications that people are moving into the cloud, they're writing them under certain assumptions, right? I'm expecting something, some standardized DNS service discovery, some standardized storage through CSI drivers, and some standardized object storage, right? So people like their storages like that. So coming from the legacy world, people were used to, okay, I'll buy some appliance, they'll send it to my data center, I'll put it, but if you're moving into the cloud, you don't ship an appliance into AWS data center or Google data center, right? So you, you expect also your object storage to be software defined and mm -hmm. to be able to, that an IT department will really like that it's also declarative, right? So this is where Minio comes easy, right? So it's like, okay, I need an object storage for certain business unit and I need with this capacity, encryption, this certain resiliency capabilities, and that's it, right? It will happen because it's on top of Kubernetes. How important was open source to your company? It was incredibly important, right? Building trust from the community, being like, okay, I understand why this thing is so fast and so reliable, right? Being able to see and then people contributing, right? If we make a mistake, we find out within minutes. So if we break something in our releases and we make a bad release, right? The community within 10 minutes will be like, this broke. Right, so we'll be like, okay, that's true. We'll patch it and make another release. So that's the, the value of open source, right? Without open source, when will we know that some obscure pattern header in some API broke? We wouldn't be able, right? So the community is actually like contributing back to us and helping us harden our software. Final yeah. question, how has cloud native technologies helped you guys be successful? I mean, obviously, you have an alternative to AWS, mm -hmm. but cloud native's also been growth with CNCF. How important has that been to your success? So, I think um, the, what has made us successful is that all these other cloud native technologies are acknowledging that, okay, I can build now different products that rely on, on top of object storage, and I need a component that can go along with me, right? You see in all of these other projects that say, well, this is how you could do it against object storage, and, and here's an example with Minio, right? Because they even test their product that way. So th that's how it has been benefiting us that the open source community also sees us as the reliable alternative of, doesn't matter if you're running my product on premise, on, on this cloud provider and this other one, as long as you have Kubernetes around, or even if it's bare metal, but we have Aminayo around, things will just work, right? So, and this is how we've been seeing it helping us. Daniel, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Great to see you. Thank you. Um, welcome to the first time on theCUBE. Daniel Minayo, engineer in the trenches, making code. Are you shifting left, making sure everything's secure? Yes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Security, data, AI, cloud native, open source, all magical pieces of the equation here uh, at theCUBE, here in an open source summit. We'll be right back with more after this short break.